Chapter 15 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter 15 Dr. Chilton. The great gray pile of masonry looked very different to Pollyanna when she made her second visit to the house of Mr. John Pendleton. Windows were open. An elderly woman was hanging out clothes in the back yard, and the doctor's gig stood under the porte cochere. As before, Pollyanna went to the side door. This time she rang the bell. Her fingers were not stiff today from a tight clutch on a bunch of keys. A familiar-looking small dog bounded up the steps to greet her but there was a slight delay before the woman who had been hanging out the clothes opened the door. "'If you please, I've brought some calf's foot jelly from Mr. Pendleton,' smiled Pollyanna. "'Thank you,' said the woman, reaching for the bowl in the little girl's hand. "'Who shall I say sent it? And it's calf's foot jelly?' The doctor Coming into the hall at that moment, heard the woman's words and saw the disappointed look on Pollyanna's face. He stepped quickly forward. Ah, some calf's foot jelly? he asked genially. That will be fine. Maybe you'd like to see our patient, eh? Oh, yes, sir, beamed Pollyanna. And the woman, in obedience to a nod from the doctor, led the way down the hall at once, though plainly with vast surprise on her face. Behind the doctor, a young man, a trained nurse from the nearest city, gave a disturbed exclamation. But doctor, didn't Mr. Pendleton give orders not to admit anyone? Oh, yes, nodded the doctor imperturbably. But I'm giving the orders now. I'll take the risk. Then he added whimsically, You don't know, of course, but that little girl is better than a six-quart bottle of tonic any day. If anything or anybody can take the grouch out of Pendleton this afternoon, she can. That's why I sent her in. Who is she? For one brief moment, the doctor hesitated. She's the niece of one of our best-known residents. Her name is Pollyanna Whittier. I, I don't happen to enjoy a very extensive personal acquaintance with the little lady as yet, but lots of my patients do, I'm thankful to say. The nurse smiled. Indeed, and what are the special ingredients of this wonder-working tonic of hers? The doctor shook his head. I don't know. As near as I can find out, it is an overwhelming, unquenchable gladness for everything that has happened or is going to happen. At any rate, her quaint speeches are constantly being repeated to me, and as near as I can make out, just being glad is the tenor of most of them. All is he added, with another whimsical smile, as he stepped out onto the porch. I wish I could prescribe her, and buy her, as I would a box of pills, though if there gets to be many of her in the world, you and I might as well go to ribbon-selling and ditch-digging for all the money we'd get out of nursing and doctoring, he laughed, picking up the reins and stepping into the gig. Pollyanna, meanwhile, in accordance with the doctor's orders, was being escorted to John Pendleton's rooms. Her way led through the great library at the end of the hall, and rapid as was her progress through it, Pollyanna saw at once that great changes had taken place. The book-lined walls and the crimson curtains were the same, but there was no litter on the floor, no untidiness on the desk, and not so much as a grain of dust in sight. The telephone card hung in its proper place, and the brass andirons had been polished. 
one of the mysterious doors was open, and it was toward this that the maid led the way. A moment later, Pollyanna found herself in a sumptuously furnished bedroom while the maid was saying in a frightened voice, If you please, sir, here, here's a little girl with some jelly. The doctor said I was to, to bring her in. The next moment Pollyanna found herself alone with a very cross-looking man lying flat on his back in bed. See here, didn't I say? began an angry voice. Oh, it's you. It broke off, not very graciously, as Pollyanna advanced toward the bed. Yes, sir, smiled Pollyanna. Oh, I'm so glad they let me in. You see, at first the lady most took my jelly, and I was so afraid I wasn't going to see you at all. Then the doctor came, and he said I might. Wasn't he lovely to let me see you? In spite of himself, the man's lips twitched into a smile, but all he said was, Oof. And I've brought you some jelly, resumed Pollyanna. Calf's foot. I hope you like it. There was a rising inflection in her voice. Never ate it. The fleeting smile had gone, and the scowl had come back to the man's face. For a brief instant, Pollyanna's countenance showed disappointment, but it cleared as she set the bowl of jelly down. Didn't you? Well, if you didn't, then you can't know you don't like it anyhow, can you? So I reckon I'm glad you haven't after all. Now, if you knew... Yes, yes, well, there's one thing I know, all right, and that is that I'm flat on my back right here this minute, and that I'm liable to stay here till doomsday, I guess. Pollyanna looked shocked. Oh, no, it couldn't be till doomsday, you know, when the angel Gabriel blows his trumpet, unless it should come quicker than we think it will. Oh, of course I know the Bible says it may come quicker than we think, but I don't think it will. That is, of course I believe the Bible, but, I mean, I don't think it will come as much quicker as it would if it should come now, and... John Pendleton laughed suddenly, and aloud. The nurse, coming in at that moment, heard the laugh, and beat a hurried, but a very silent, retreat. He had the air of a frightened cook, who, seeing the danger of a breath of cold air striking a half-done cake, hastily shuts the oven door. "'Aren't you getting a little mixed?' asked John Pendleton of Pollyanna. The little girl laughed. "'Maybe. But what I mean is that lengths don't last. Broken ones, you know. Like lifelong invalids, as Mrs. Snow has got.' So yours won't last till doomsday at all. I should think you could be glad of that. Oh, I am, retorted the man grimly. And you didn't break but one. You can be glad twasn't two. Pollyanna was warming to her task. Of course, so fortunate, sniffed the man with uplifted eyebrows. Looking at it from that standpoint... I suppose I might be glad I wasn't a centipede and didn't break fifty. Pollyanna chuckled. Oh, that's the best yet, she crowed. I know what a centipede is. They've got lots of legs. And you can be glad. Oh, of course, interrupted the man sharply, all the old bitterness coming back to his voice. I can be glad, too, for all the rest, I suppose. The nurse, and the doctor, and that confounded woman in the kitchen. Why, yes, sir. Only think how bad twould be if you didn't have them. Well, I... Eh? He demanded sharply. Why, I say, only think how bad it would be if you didn't have them, and you lying here like this. As if that wasn't the very thing that was at the bottom of the whole matter retorted the man testily. Because I am lying here like this. 
and yet you expect me to say I'm glad because of a fool woman who disarranges the whole house and calls it regulating, and a man who aids and abets her in it and calls it nursing to say nothing of the doctor who eggs them both on, and the whole bunch of them meanwhile expecting me to pay them for it, and pay them well too. Pollyanna frowned sympathetically. Yes, I know. That part is too bad. About the money. When you've been saving it, too, all this time. When? Eh? Saving it. Buying beans and fish balls, you know. Say, do you like beans? Or do you like turkey better, only on account of the 60 cents? Look at here, child. What are you talking about? Pollyanna smiled radiantly. About your money, you know. Denying yourself and saving it for the heathen. You see, I found out about it. Why, Mr. Pendleton, that's one of the ways I knew you weren't cross inside. Nancy told me. The man's jaw dropped. Nancy told you I was saving money for the... Well, may I inquire who Nancy is? Our Nancy. She works for Aunt Polly. Aunt Polly. Well, who is Aunt Polly? She's Miss Polly Harrington. I live with her. The man made a sudden movement. Miss Polly Harrington? He breathed. You live with her? Yes, I'm her niece. She's taken me to bring up, on account of my mother, you know, faltered Pollyanna in a low voice. She was her sister, and after father went to be with her and the rest of us in heaven, there wasn't anyone left for me down here but the lady's aid. So she took me in. The man did not answer. His face, as he lay back on the pillow now, was very white. So white that Pollyanna was frightened. She rose uncertainly to her feet. I reckon maybe I'd better go now, she proposed. I, I hope you'll like the jelly. The man turned his head suddenly and opened his eyes. There was a curious longing in their dark depths which even Pollyanna saw, and at which she marveled. And so you are Miss Polly Harrington's niece, he said gently. Yes, sir. Still the man's dark eyes lingered on her face, until Pollyanna, feeling vaguely restless, murmured, I, I suppose you know her? John Pendleton's lips curved in an odd smile. Oh, yes, I know her. He hesitated, then went on, still with that curious smile. But... You don't mean, you can't mean that it was Miss Polly Harrington who sent that jelly to me, he said slowly. Pollyanna looked distressed. N no, sir, she didn't. She said I must be very sure not to let you think she did send it. But I... I thought as much, vouchsafed the man shortly turning away his head. And Pollyanna, still more distressed, tiptoed from the room. Under the porte cochere, she found the doctor waiting in his gig. The nurse stood on the steps. Well, Miss Pollyanna, may I have the pleasure of seeing you home? asked the doctor smilingly. I started to drive on a few minutes ago. Then it occurred to me that I'd wait for you. Thank you, sir. I'm glad you did. I just love to ride. 
beamed Pollyanna, as he reached out his hand to help her in. Do you? smiled the doctor, nodding his head in farewell to the young man on the steps. Well, as near as I can judge, there are a good many things you love to do, eh? he added as they drove briskly away. Pollyanna laughed. Why, I don't know. I reckon perhaps there are, she admitted. I like to do most everything that's living. Of course, I don't like the other things very well. Sewing and reading out loud and all that. But they aren't living. No? What are they then? Aunt Polly says they're learning to live, sighed Pollyanna with a rueful smile. The doctor smiled now, a little queerly. Does she? Well, I should think she might say just that. Yes, responded Pollyanna. But I don't see it that way at all. I don't think you have to learn how to live. I didn't anyhow. The doctor drew a long sigh. After all, I'm afraid some of us do have to, little girl, he said. Then for a time, he was silent. Pollyanna, stealing a glance at his face, felt vaguely sorry for him. He looked so sad. She wished uneasily that she could do something. It was this, perhaps, that caused her to say in a timid voice, Dr. Chilton, I should think being a doctor would be the very gladdest kind of a business there was. The doctor turned in surprise. Gladdest? When I see so much suffering, always, everywhere I go, he cried. She nodded. I know, but you're helping it, don't you see? And of course you're glad to help it. And so that makes you the gladdest of any of us all the time. The doctor's eyes filled with sudden hot tears. The doctor's life was a singularly lonely one. He had no wife and no home save his two-room office in a boarding house. His profession was very dear to him. Looking now into Pollyanna's shining eyes, he felt as if a loving hand had been suddenly laid on his head in blessing. He knew, too, that never again would a long day's work or a long night's weariness be quite without that new-found exaltation that had come to him through Pollyanna's eyes. God bless you, little girl, he said unsteadily. Then, with the bright smile his patients knew and loved so well, he added, And I'm thinking, after all, that it was the doctor quite as much as his patients that needed a draft of that tonic. All of which puzzled Pollyanna very much, until a chipmunk running across the road drove the whole matter from her mind. The doctor left Pollyanna at her own door, smiled at Nancy, who was sweeping off the front porch, then drove rapidly away. I've had a perfectly beautiful ride with the doctor, announced Pollyanna, bounding up the steps. He's lovely, Nancy. Is he? Yes, and I told him I should think his business would be the very gladdest one there was. What? Going to see sick folks? And folks what ain't sick but thinks they is, which is worse? Nancy's face showed open skepticism. Pollyanna laughed gleefully. Yes, that's most what he said, too. But there is a way to be glad, even then. Guess! Nancy frowned in meditation. Nancy was getting so she could play this game of being glad quite successfully, she thought. She rather enjoyed studying out Pollyanna's posers, too, 
as she called some of the little girl's questions. Oh, I know, she chuckled. It's just the opposite from what you told Miss Snow. Opposite? repeated Pollyanna, obviously puzzled. Yes, you told her she could be glad because other folks wasn't like her, all sick, you know. Yes, nodded Pollyanna. Well, the doctor can be glad because he isn't like other folks. The sick ones, I mean, what he doctors, finished Nancy in triumph. It was Pollyanna's turn to frown. Why, yes, she admitted. Of course, that is one way, but it isn't the way I said, and some way I don't seem to quite like the sound of it. It isn't exactly as if he said he was glad they were sick, but... You do play the game so funny sometimes, Nancy, she sighed as she went into the house. Pollyanna found her aunt in the sitting room. Who was that man? The one who drove into the yard, Pollyanna? Questioned the lady a little sharply. Why, Aunt Polly, that was Dr. Chilton. Don't you know him? Dr. Chilton? What was he doing here? He drove me home. Oh, and I gave the jelly to Mr. Pendleton and... Miss Polly lifted her head quickly. Pollyanna, he did not think I sent it. Oh, no, Aunt Polly. I told him you didn't. Miss Polly grew a sudden vivid pink. You told him I didn't? Pollyanna opened wide her eyes at the remonstrative dismay in her aunt's voice. Why, Aunt Polly, you said to. Aunt Polly sighed. I said, Pollyanna, that I did not send it and for you to be very sure that he did not think I did, which is a very different matter from telling him outright that I did not send it. And she turned vexedly away. Dear me, well, I don't see where the difference is, sighed Pollyanna as she went to hang her hat on the one particular hook in the house upon which Aunt Polly had said that it must be hung. End of chapter 15 Recording by The Story Girl Chapter 16 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 16. A Red Rose and a Lace Shawl. It was on a rainy day, about a week after Pollyanna's visit to Mr. John Pendleton, that Miss Polly was driven by Timothy to an early afternoon committee meeting of the Ladies' Aid Society. When she returned at three o'clock, her cheeks were a bright, pretty pink, and her hair, blown by the damp wind, had fluffed into kinks and curls wherever the loosened pins had given leave. Pollyanna had never before seen her aunt look like this. Oh, 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 my Aunt Polly, you've got him too, she cried rapturously, dancing round and round her aunt as that lady entered the sitting room. "'Got what, you impossible child?' Pollyanna was still revolving round and round her aunt. "'And I never knew you had em. "'Can folks have em when you don't know they've got em? "'Do you suppose I could? "'Fore I get to heaven, I mean,' she cried, "'pulling out with eager fingers the straight locks above her ears. "'But then they wouldn't be black if they did come. "'You can't hide the black part.' Pollyanna, what does all this mean? demanded Aunt Polly, hurriedly removing her hat and trying to smooth back her disordered hair. No, no, please, Aunt Polly. Pollyanna's jubilant voice turned to one of distressed appeal. Don't smooth them out. It's those that I'm talking about. 
those darling little black curls. Oh, Aunt Polly, they're so pretty. Nonsense. What do you mean, Pollyanna, by going to the ladies' aid the other day in that absurd fashion about that beggar boy? But it isn't nonsense, urged Pollyanna, answering only the first of her aunt's remarks. You don't know how pretty you look with your hair like that. Oh, Aunt Polly, please, mayn't I do your hair like I did Mrs. Snow's and put in a flower? I'd so love to see you that way. Why, you'd be ever so much prettier than she was. Pollyanna. Miss Polly spoke very sharply, all the more sharply because Pollyanna's words had given her an odd throb of joy. When before had anybody cared how she or her hair looked? When before had anybody loved to see her pretty? Pollyanna, you did not answer my question. Why did you go to the ladies' aid in that absurd fashion? Yes, um, I know, but please, I didn't know it was absurd until I went and found out they'd rather see their report grow than Jimmy. So then I wrote to my ladies' aiders, because Jimmy is far away from them, you know. And I thought maybe he could be their little India boy, same as... Aunt Polly, was I your little India girl? And Aunt Polly, you will let me do your hair, won't you? Aunt Polly put her hand to her throat. That old helpless feeling was upon her, she knew. But Pollyanna, when the ladies told me this afternoon how you came to them, I was so ashamed. I... Pollyanna began to dance up and down lightly on her toes. You didn't. You didn't say I couldn't do your hair, she crowed triumphantly. And so I'm sure it means just the other way round, sort of, like it did the other day about Mr. Pendleton's jelly that you didn't send, but didn't want me to say you didn't send, you know. Now wait, just where you are. I'll get a comb. But Pollyanna, Pollyanna, remonstrated Aunt Polly, following the little girl from the room and panting upstairs after her. Oh, did you come up here? Pollyanna greeted her at the door of Miss Polly's own room. That'll be nicer yet. I've got the comb. Now sit down, please, right here. Oh, I'm so glad you let me do it. But Pollyanna, I... I... Miss Polly did not finish her sentence. To her helpless amazement, she found herself in the low chair before the dressing table, with her hair already tumbling about her ears under ten eager but very gentle fingers. Oh, my! What pretty hair you've got! prattled Pollyanna. And there's so much more of it than Mrs. Snow has, too. But, of course, you need more anyhow, because you're well and can go to places where folks can see it. My, I reckon folks will be glad when they do see it. And surprised, too, because you've hid it so long. Why, Aunt Polly, I'll make you so pretty. Everybody will just love to look at you. Pollyanna, gasped a stifled but shocked voice from a veil of hair. I, I'm sure I don't know why I'm letting you do this silly thing. Why, Aunt Polly, I should think you'd be glad to have folks like to look at you. Don't you like to look at pretty things? I'm ever so much happier when I look at pretty folks, because when I look at the other kind, I'm so sorry for them. But, but, and I just love to do folks' hair, purred Pollyanna contentedly. I did quite a lot of the ladies' aiders, but there wasn't any of them so nice as yours. Mrs. White's was pretty nice, though, and she looked just lovely one day when I dressed her up and... Oh, Aunt Polly, I've just happened to think of something. But it's a secret, and I shan't tell. Now your hair is almost done, and pretty quick, I'm going to leave you just a minute, and you must promise, 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 not to stir nor peek even till I come back. Now remember, she finished as she ran from the room. Aloud, Miss Polly said nothing. 
To herself she said that of course she should at once undo the absurd work of her niece's fingers and put her hair up properly again. As for peeking, just as if she cared how... At that moment, unaccountably, Miss Polly caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror of the dressing table. And what she saw sent such a flush of rosy color to her cheeks that she only flushed the more at the sight. She saw a face, not young, it is true, but just now, alight with excitement and surprise. The cheeks were a pretty pink. The eyes sparkled. The hair, dark and still damp from the outdoor air, lay in loose waves about the forehead and curved back over the ears in wonderfully becoming lines, with softening little curls here and there. So amazed and so absorbed was Miss Polly with what she saw in the glass that she quite forgot her determination to do over her hair until she heard Pollyanna enter the room again. Before she could move then, she felt a folded something slipped across her eyes and tied in the back. Pollyanna! Pollyanna! What are you doing? she cried. Pollyanna chuckled. That's just what I don't want you to know, Aunt Polly. And I was afraid you would peek, so I tied on the handkerchief. Now sit still. It won't take but just a minute. Then I'll let you see. But Pollyanna, began Miss Polly, struggling blindly to her feet. You must take this off. You, child, child, what are you doing? She gasped as she felt a soft something slipped about her shoulders. Pollyanna only chuckled the more gleefully. With trembling fingers, she was draping about her aunt's shoulders the fleecy folds of a beautiful lace shawl, yellowed from long years of packing away and fragrant with lavender. Pollyanna had found the shawl the week before, when Nancy had been regulating the attic and it had occurred to her today that there was no reason why her aunt, as well as Mrs. White of her western home, should not be dressed up. Her task completed, Pollyanna surveyed her work with eyes that approved, but that saw yet one touch wanting. Promptly, therefore, she pulled her aunt toward the sun parlor, where she could see a belated red rose blooming on the trellis within reach of her hand. Pollyanna, what are you doing? Where are you taking me to? recoiled Aunt Polly, vainly trying to hold herself back. Pollyanna, I shall not. It's just to the sun parlor. Only a minute. I'll have you ready now quicker in no time, panted Pollyanna, reaching for the rose and thrusting it into the soft hair above Miss Polly's left ear. There, she exulted, untying the knot of the handkerchief and flinging the bit of linen far from her. Oh, Aunt Polly, now I reckon you'll be glad I've dressed you up. For one dazed moment, Miss Polly looked at her bedecked self and at her surroundings, then she gave a low cry and fled to her room. Pollyanna, following the direction of her aunt's last dismayed gaze, saw through the open windows of the sun parlor the horse and gig turning into the driveway. She recognized at once the man who held the reins. Delightedly, she leaned forward. Dr. Chilton! Dr. Chilton! Did you want to see me? I'm up here! Yes, smiled the doctor a little gravely. Will you come down, please? In the bedroom, Pollyanna found a flushed-faced, angry-eyed woman plucking at the pins that held a lace shawl in place. Pollyanna, how could you? moaned the woman. To think of your rigging me up like this and then letting me be seen. Pollyanna stopped in dismay. But you look lovely. 
perfectly lovely, Aunt Polly, and lovely, scorned the woman, flinging the shawl to one side and attacking her hair with shaking fingers. Oh, Aunt Polly, please, please let the hair stay. Stay? Like this? As if I would? And Miss Polly pulled the lock so tightly back that the last curl lay stretched dead at the end of her fingers. Oh, dear. And you did look so pretty, almost sobbed Pollyanna as she stumbled through the door. Downstairs, Pollyanna found the doctor waiting in his gig. I've prescribed you for a patient, and he sent me to get the prescription filled, announced the doctor. Will you go? You mean an errand to the drugstore? asked Pollyanna a little uncertainly. I used to go some for the ladies' aiders. The doctor shook his head with a smile. Not exactly. It's Mr. John Pendleton. He would like to see you today, if you'll be so good as to come. It stopped raining, so I drove down after you. Will you come? I'll call for you and bring you back before six o'clock. I'd love to, exclaimed Pollyanna. Let me ask Aunt Polly. In a few moments, she returned, hat in hand, but with rather a sober face. Didn't your aunt want you to go? Asked the doctor a little diffidently as they drove away. Yes, sighed Pollyanna. She, she wanted me to go too much, I'm afraid. Wanted you to go too much? Pollyanna sighed again. Yes, I reckon she meant she didn't want me there. You see, she said, yes, yes, run along, run along, do. I wish you'd gone before. The doctor smiled but with his lips only. His eyes were very grave. For some time he said nothing. Then, a little hesitatingly, he asked, Wasn't it your aunt I saw with you a few minutes ago, in the window of the sun parlor? Pollyanna drew a long breath. Yes, that's what's the whole trouble, I suppose. You see, I dressed her up in a perfectly lovely lace shawl I found upstairs, and I'd fixed her hair and put on a rose, and she looked so pretty. Didn't you think she looked just lovely? For a moment, the doctor did not answer. When he did speak, his voice was so low, Pollyanna could but just hear the words. Yes, Pollyanna. I, I thought she did look. Just lovely. Did you? I'm so glad. I'll tell her, nodded the little girl contentedly. To her surprise, the doctor gave a sudden exclamation. Never. <laughs> Pollyanna, I, I'm afraid I shall have to ask you not to tell her that. Why, Dr. Chilton? Why not? I should think you'd be glad. But she might not be cut in the doctor. Pollyanna considered this for a moment. That's so. Maybe she wouldn't, she sighed. I remember now. Twas cause she saw you that she ran, and she... she spoke afterwards about her being seen in that rig. I thought as much, declared the doctor under his breath. Still... I don't see why, maintained Pollyanna, when she looked so pretty. The doctor said nothing. He did not speak again, indeed, until they were almost to the great stone house in which John Pendleton lay with a broken leg. End of chapter 16 Recording by The Story Girl Chapter 17 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter 17 Just Like a Book John Pendleton greeted Pollyanna today with a smile. Well, Miss Pollyanna, I'm thinking you must be a very forgiving little person, else you wouldn't have come to see me again today. Why, Mr. Pendleton, I was real glad to come, and I'm sure I don't see why I shouldn't be either. Oh, well, you know I was pretty cross with you, I'm afraid, both the other day when you so kindly brought me the jelly, and that time when you found me with the broken leg at first. By the way, too, I don't think I've ever thanked you for that. Now I'm sure that even you would admit that you were very forgiving to come and see me, after such ungrateful treatment as that. Pollyanna stirred uneasily. But I was glad to find you. That is, I don't mean I was glad your leg was broken, of course. She corrected hurriedly. John Pendleton smiled. I understand. Your tongue does get away with you once in a while, doesn't it, Miss Pollyanna? I do thank you, however, and I consider you a very brave little girl to do what you did that day. I thank you for the jelly, too. He added in a lighter voice. Did you like it? asked Pollyanna with interest. Very much. I suppose there isn't any more today that uh, that Aunt Polly didn't send, is there? He asked with an odd smile. His visitor looked distressed. No, sir. She hesitated, then went on with heightened color. Please, Mr. Pendleton... I didn't mean to be rude the other day when I said Aunt Polly did not send the jelly. There was no answer. John Pendleton was not smiling now. He was looking straight ahead of him, with eyes that seemed to be gazing through and beyond the object before them. After a time he drew a long sigh and turned to Pollyanna. When he spoke, his voice carried the old, nervous fretfulness. Well, well, this will never do at all. I didn't send for you to see me moping this time. Listen, out in the library, the big room where the telephone is, you know, you will find a carved box on the lower shelf of the big case with glass doors in the corner not far from the fireplace. That is, it'll be there if that confounded woman hasn't regulated it to somewhere else. You may bring it to me. It is heavy, but not too heavy for you to carry, I think. Oh, I'm awfully strong, declared Pollyanna cheerfully as she sprang to her feet. In a minute, she had returned with the box. It was a wonderful half hour that Pollyanna spent then. The box was full of treasures, curios that John Pendleton had picked up in years of travel, and concerning each there was some entertaining story, whether it were a set of exquisitely carved chessmen from China or a little jade idol from India. It was after she had heard the story about the idol that Pollyanna murmured wistfully, Well, I suppose it would be better to take a little boy in India to bring up, one that didn't know any more than to think that God was in that doll thing, than it would be to take Jimmy Bean, a little boy who knows God is up in the sky. Still, I can't help wishing they had wanted Jimmy Bean too, besides the India boys. John Pendleton did not seem to hear. Again, his eyes were staring straight before him, looking at nothing. But soon he had roused himself and had picked up another curio to talk about. The visit, certainly, was a delightful one. But before it was over, 
Pollyanna was realizing that they were talking about something besides the wonderful things in the beautiful carved box. They were talking of herself, of Nancy, of Aunt Polly, and of her daily life. They were talking, too, even of the life and home long ago in the far western town. Not until it was nearly time for her to go did the man say, in a voice Pollyanna had never before heard from stern John Pendleton, Little girl, I want you to come to see me often. Will you? I'm lonesome and I need you. There's another reason, and I'm going to tell you that, too. I thought at first, after I found out who you were the other day, that I didn't want you to come any more. You reminded me of... of something I have tried for long years to forget. So I said to myself that I never wanted to see you again. And every day, when the doctor asked if I wouldn't let him bring you to me, I said no. But after a time, I found I was wanting to see you so much that, that the fact that I wasn't seeing you was making me remember all the more vividly the thing I was so wanting to forget. So now, I want you to come. Will you, little girl? Why, yes, Mr. Pendleton, breathed Pollyanna, her eyes luminous with sympathy for the sad-faced man lying back on the pillow before her. I'd love to come. Thank you, said John Pendleton gently. After supper that evening, Pollyanna, sitting on the back porch, told Nancy all about Mr. John Pendleton's wonderful carved box and the still more wonderful things it contained. And to think, sighed Nancy, that he showed you all them things and told you about him like that. Him that's so cross he never talks to no one. No one. Oh, but he isn't cross, Nancy. Only outside, demurred Pollyanna with quick loyalty. I don't see why everybody thinks he's so bad, either. They wouldn't if they knew him. But even Aunt Polly doesn't like him very well. She wouldn't send the jelly to him, you know, and she was so afraid he'd think she did send it. Probably she didn't call him no duty, shrugged Nancy. But what beats me is how he happened to take to you so, Miss Pollyanna. Meaning no offense to you, of course, but he ain't the sort of man what generally takes to kids. He ain't, he ain't. Pollyanna smiled happily. But he did, Nancy, she nodded. Only, I reckon even he didn't want to. All the time. Why, only today he owned up that one time he just felt he never wanted to see me again because I reminded him of something he wanted to forget. But afterwards, what's that? Interrupted Nancy excitedly. He said you reminded him of something he wanted to forget? Yes, but afterwards, what was it? Nancy was eagerly insistent. He didn't tell me. He just said it was something. The mystery breathed Nancy in an awestruck voice. That's why he took to you in the first place. Oh, Miss Pollyanna, why, that's just like a book. I've read lots of them. Lady Maud's Secret and The Lost Heir and Hidden for Years. All of them had mysteries and things just like this. My stars and stockings, just think of having a book lived right under your nose like this and me not knowing it all this time. Now tell me everything. Everything he said, Miss Pollyanna, there's a dear. No wonder he took to you. No wonder, no wonder. But he didn't, cried Pollyanna. Not till I talked to him first 
and he didn't even know who I was till I took the calf's foot jelly and had to make him understand that Aunt Polly didn't send it, and... Nancy sprang to her feet and clasped her hands together suddenly. Oh, Miss Pollyanna, I know, I know, I know, I know, she exulted rapturously. The next minute she was down at Pollyanna's side again. Tell me, now think, an answer straight and true, she urged excitedly. It was after he found out you was Miss Polly's niece that he said he didn't ever want to see you again, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I told him that the last time I saw him, and he told me this today. I thought as much, triumphed Nancy. And Miss Polly wouldn't send the jelly herself, would she? No. And you told him she didn't send it? Why, well, yes, I... And he began to act queer and cry out sudden after he found out you was her niece. He did that, didn't he? Why... Well, Yes, he did act a little queer over that jelly, admitted Pollyanna with a thoughtful frown. Nancy drew a long sigh. Then I've got it sure. Now listen, Mr. John Pendleton was Miss Polly Harrington's lover, she announced impressively but with a furtive glance over her shoulder. Why, Nancy, he couldn't be. She doesn't like him, objected Pollyanna. Nancy gave her a scornful glance. Of course she don't. That's the quarrel. Pollyanna still looked incredulous, and with another long breath, Nancy happily settled herself to tell the story. It's like this. Just before you come, Mr. Tom told me Miss Polly had had a lover once. I didn't believe it. I couldn't. Her and a lover? But Mr. Tom said she had and that he was living now right in this town. And now I know, of course, it's John Pendleton. Ain't he got a mystery in his life? Don't he shut himself up in that grand house alone and never speak to no one? Didn't he act queer when he found out you was Miss Polly's niece? And now, ain't he owned up that you remind him of something he wants to forget? Just as if anybody couldn't see twas Miss Polly. And her saying she wouldn't send him no jelly too. Why, Miss Pollyanna, it's as plain as the nose on your face it is, it is. Oh, breathed Pollyanna in wide-eyed amazement. But Nancy, I should think if they loved each other, they'd make up some time. Both of them all alone so, all these years? I should think they'd be glad to make up. Nancy sniffed disdainfully. I guess maybe you don't know much about lovers, Miss Pollyanna. You ain't big enough yet, anyhow. But if there is a set of folks in the world that wouldn't have no use for that air glad game of yourn, it'd be a pair of quarreling lovers, and that's what they be. Ain't he cross as sticks most generally? And ain't she? Nancy stopped abruptly, remembering just in time to whom and about whom she was speaking. Suddenly, however, she chuckled. I ain't saying, though, Miss Pollyanna, but what it would be a pretty slick piece of business if you could get em to play in it, so they would be glad to make up. But my land, wouldn't folks stare some? Miss Polly and him. I guess, though, there ain't much chance, much chance. Pollyanna said nothing. But when she went into the house a little later, her face was very thoughtful. End of chapter 17 Recording by The Story Girl Chapter 18 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter 18 Prisms As the warm August days passed, Pollyanna went very frequently to the great house on Pendleton Hill. She did not feel, however, that her visits were really a success. Not what but the man seemed to want her there. He sent for her, indeed, frequently. But that when she was there, he seemed scarcely any the happier for her presence. At least, so Pollyanna thought. He talked to her, it was true, and he showed her many strange and beautiful things. Books, pictures, and curios but he still fretted audibly over his own helplessness, and he chafed visibly under the rules and regulatings of the unwelcome members of his household. He did indeed seem to like to hear Pollyanna talk, however, and Pollyanna talked. Pollyanna liked to talk, but she was never sure that she would not look up and find him lying back on his pillow with that white, hurt look that always pained her, and she was never sure which, if any, of her words had brought it there. As for telling him the glad game and trying to get him to play it, Pollyanna had never seen the time yet when she thought he would care to hear about it. She had twice tried to tell him, but neither time had she got beyond the beginning of what her father had said, John Pendleton had on each occasion turned the conversation abruptly to another subject. Pollyanna never doubted now that John Pendleton was her Aunt Polly's one-time lover, and with all the strength of her loving, loyal heart, she wished she could in some way bring happiness into their, to her mind, miserably lonely lives. Just how she was to do this, however, she could not see. She talked to Mr. Pendleton about her aunt, and he listened, sometimes politely, sometimes irritably, frequently with a quizzical smile on his usually stern lips. She talked to her aunt about Mr. Pendleton, or rather she tried to talk to her about him. As a general thing, however, Miss Polly would not listen long. She always found something else to talk about. She frequently did that, however, when Pollyanna was talking of others. Dr. Chilton, for instance. Pollyanna laid this, though, to the fact that it had been Dr. Chilton who had seen her in the sun parlor with the rose in her hair and the lace shawl draped about her shoulders. Aunt Polly, indeed, seemed particularly bitter against Dr. Chilton, as Pollyanna found out one day when a hard cold shut her up in the house. "'If you are not better by night, I shall send for the doctor,' Aunt Polly said. "'Shall you? Then I'm going to get worse,' gurgled Pollyanna. "'I'd love to have Dr. Chilton come to see me.' She wondered then at the look that came to her aunt's face. "'It will not be Dr. Chilton, Pollyanna,' Miss Polly said sternly. "'Dr. Chilton is not our family physician. "'I shall send for Dr. Warren, if you are worse.' Pollyanna did not grow worse, however, and Dr. Warren was not summoned. "'And I'm so glad, too.' Pollyanna said to her aunt that evening. Of course, I like Dr. Warren and all that, but I like Dr. Chilton better, and I'm afraid he'd feel hurt if I didn't have him. You see, he wasn't really to blame, after all, that he happened to see you when I dressed you up so pretty that day, Aunt Polly, she finished wistfully. That will do, Pollyanna. I really do not wish to discuss Dr. Chilton. Or his feelings, reproved Miss Polly decisively. Pollyanna looked at her for a moment with mournfully interested eyes. Then she sighed. 
I just love to see you when your cheeks are pink like that, Aunt Polly. But I would so like to fix your hair if, why, Aunt Polly? But her aunt was already out of sight down the hall. It was toward the end of August that Pollyanna, making an early morning call on John Pendleton, found the flaming band of blue and gold and green edged with red and violet lying across his pillow. She stopped short in awed delight. Why, Mr. Pendleton, it's a baby rainbow. A real rainbow come in to pay you a visit, she exclaimed, clapping her hands together softly. Oh, 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 how pretty it is. But how did it get in? she cried. The man laughed a little grimly. John Pendleton was particularly out of sorts with the world this morning. Well, I suppose it got in through the beveled edge of that glass thermometer in the window, he said wearily. The sun shouldn't strike it at all, but it does in the morning. Oh, but it's so pretty, Mr. Pendleton. And does just the sun do that? My, if it was mine, I'd have it hang in the sun all day long. Lots of good you'd get out of the thermometer, then, laughed the man. How do you suppose you could tell how hot it was, or how cold it was, if the thermometer hung in the sun all day? I shouldn't care, breathed Pollyanna, her fascinated eyes on the brilliant band of colors across the pillow. Just as if anybody'd care when they were living all the time in a rainbow. The man laughed. He was watching Pollyanna's rapt face a little curiously. Suddenly, a new thought came to him. He touched the bell at his side. Laura, he said when the elderly maid appeared at the door. Bring me one of the big brass candlesticks from the mantel in the front drawing room. Yes, sir, murmured the woman, looking slightly dazed. In a minute she had returned. A musical tinkling entered the room with her as she advanced wonderingly toward the bed. It came from the prism pendants encircling the old-fashioned candelabrum in her hand. Thank you. You may set it here on the stand, directed the man. Now get a string and fasten it to the sash curtain fixtures of that window there. Take down the sash curtain and let the string reach straight across the window from side to side. That will be all. Thank you, he said when she had carried out his directions. As she left the room, he turned smiling eyes toward the wondering Pollyanna. Bring me the candlestick now, please, Pollyanna. With both hands she brought it, and in a moment... He was slipping off the pendants, one by one, until they lay, a round dozen of them, side by side on the bed. Now, my dear, suppose you take them and hook them to that little string Nora fixed across the window. If you really want to live in a rainbow, I don't see, but we'll have to have a rainbow for you to live in. Pollyanna had not hung up three of the pendants in the sunlit window before she saw a little of what was going to happen. She was so excited then she could scarcely control her shaking fingers enough to hang up the rest. But at last her task was finished, and she stepped back with a low cry of delight. It had become a fairyland, that sumptuous but dreary bedroom. Everywhere were bits of dancing red and green, violet and orange, gold and blue. The wall, the floor, and the furniture, even to the bed itself, were aflame with shimmering bits of color. Oh, 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 how lovely, breathed Pollyanna. Then she laughed suddenly. 
I just reckon the sun himself is trying to play the game now, don't you? She cried, forgetting for the moment that Mr. Pendleton could not know what she was talking about. Oh, how I wish I had a lot of those things. How I would like to give them to Aunt Polly and Mrs. Snow and lots of folks. I reckon then they'd be glad, all right. Why, I think even Aunt Polly'd get so glad she couldn't help banging doors if she lived in a rainbow like that. Don't you? Mr. Pendleton laughed. Well, from my remembrance of your aunt, Miss Pollyanna, I must say I think it would take something more than a few prisms in the sunlight to to make her bang many doors for gladness. But come now, really, what do you mean? Pollyanna stared slightly. Then she drew a long breath. Oh, I forgot. You don't know about the game. I remember now. Suppose you tell me then. And this time, Pollyanna told him. She told him the whole thing from the very first, from the crutches that should have been a doll. As she talked, she did not look at his face. Her rapt eyes were still on the dancing flecks of color from the prism pendants swaying in the sunlit window. And that's all, she sighed when she had finished. And now you know why I said the sun was trying to play it. That game. For a moment, there was silence. Then a low voice from the bed said unsteadily, Perhaps, but I'm thinking that the very finest prism of them all is yourself, Pollyanna. Oh, but I don't show beautiful red and green and purple when the sun shines through me, Mr. Pendleton. Don't you? smiled the man. And Pollyanna, looking into his face, wondered why there were tears in his eyes. No, she said. Then after a minute, she added mournfully, I'm afraid, Mr. Pendleton, the sun doesn't make anything but freckles out of me. Aunt Polly says it does make them. The man laughed a little, and again Pollyanna looked at him. The laugh had sounded almost like a sob. End of chapter 18 Recording by The Story Girl Chapter 19 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl Chapter 19 Which is somewhat surprising Pollyanna entered school in September. Preliminary examinations showed that she was well advanced for a girl of her years, and she was soon a happy member of a class of girls and boys her own age. School, in some ways, was a surprise to Pollyanna, and Pollyanna certainly, in many ways, was very much of a surprise to school. They were soon on the best of terms, however, and to her aunt, Pollyanna confessed that going to school was living after all, though she had had her doubts before. In spite of her delight in her new work, Pollyanna did not forget her old friends. True, she could not give them quite so much time now, of course, but she gave them what time she could. Perhaps John Pendleton of them all, however, was the most dissatisfied. One Saturday afternoon, he spoke to her about it. See here, Pollyanna. How would you like to come and live with me? He asked, a little impatiently. I don't see anything of you nowadays. Pollyanna laughed. Mr. Pendleton was such a funny man. 
I thought you didn't like to have folks round, she said. He made a wry face. Oh, but that was before you taught me to play that wonderful game of yours. Now I'm glad to be waited on, hand and foot. Never mind, I'll be on my own two feet yet one of these days. Then I'll see who steps round, he finished, picking up one of the crutches at his side and shaking it playfully at the little girl. They were sitting in the great library today. Oh, but you aren't really glad at all for those things. You just say you are, pouted Pollyanna, her eyes on the dog, dozing before the fire. You know you don't play the game right ever, Mr. Pendleton. You know you don't. The man's face grew suddenly very grave. That's why I want you, little girl, to help me play it. Will you come? Pollyanna turned in surprise. Mr. Pendleton, you don't really mean that. But I do. I want you. Will you come? Pollyanna looked distressed. Why, Mr. Pendleton, I can't. You know I can't. Why, I'm Aunt Polly's. A quick something crossed the man's face that Pollyanna could not quite understand. His head came up almost fiercely. You're no more hers than... Perhaps she would let you come to me, he finished more gently. Would you come if she did? Pollyanna frowned in deep thought. But Aunt Polly has been so good to me, she began slowly. And she took me in when I didn't have anybody left but the lady's aid, and... Again, that spasm of something crossed the man's face. But this time, when he spoke, his voice was low and very sad. Pollyanna, long years ago, I loved somebody very much. I hoped to bring her some day. To this house. I pictured how happy we'd be together in our home all the long years to come. Yes, pitied Pollyanna, her eyes shining with sympathy. But, well, I didn't bring her here. Never mind why. I just didn't, that's all. And ever since then, this great gray pile of stone has been a house, never a home. It takes a woman's hand and heart or a child's presence to make a home, Pollyanna. And I have not had either. Now will you come, my dear? Pollyanna sprang to her feet. Her face was fairly illumined. Mr. Pendleton, you... You mean that you wish you, you had had that woman's hand and heart all this time? Why, yes, Pollyanna. Oh, I'm so glad that it's all right, sighed the little girl. Oh, I'm so glad that it's all right, sighed the little girl. Now you can take us both and everything will be lovely. Take you both, repeated the man dazedly. A faint doubt crossed Pollyanna's countenance. Well, of course, Aunt Polly isn't won over yet, but I'm sure she will be if you tell it to her, just as you did to me, and then we both come, of course. A look of actual terror leapt to the man's eyes. Aunt Polly, come here! Pollyanna's eyes widened a little. Would you rather go there? She asked. Of course, the house isn't quite so pretty, but it's nearer. Pollyanna, 
What are you talking about? Asked the man very gently now. Why, about where we're going to live, of course, rejoined Pollyanna in obvious surprise. I thought you meant here at first. You said it was here that you had wanted Aunt Polly's hand and heart all these years to make a home, and... An inarticulate cry came from the man's throat. He raised his hand and began to speak, but the next moment he dropped his hand nervelessly at his side. "'The doctor, sir,' said the maid in the doorway. Pollyanna rose at once. John Pendleton turned to her feverishly. "'Pollyanna, for heaven's sake, say nothing of what I asked you, yet,' he begged in a low voice. Pollyanna dimpled into a sunny smile. Of course not. Just as if I didn't know you'd rather tell her yourself, she called back merrily over her shoulder. John Pendleton fell limply back in his chair. Why, what's up? demanded the doctor a minute later, his fingers on his patient's galloping pulse. A whimsical smile trembled on John Pendleton's lips. Overdose of your tonic, I guess, he laughed, as he noted the doctor's eyes following Pollyanna's little figure down the driveway. End of chapter 19 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 20 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 20 Which is More Surprising. Sunday mornings, Pollyanna usually attended church and Sunday school. Sunday afternoons, she frequently went for a walk with Nancy. She had planned one for the day after her Saturday afternoon visit to Mr. John Pendleton, but on the way home from Sunday school, Dr. Chilton overtook her in his gig and brought his horse to a stop. "'Suppose you let me drive you home, Pollyanna,' he suggested. "'I want to speak to you a minute. "'I was just driving out to your place to tell you,' he went on as Pollyanna settled herself at his side." Mr. Pendleton sent a special request for you to go see him this afternoon. Sure. He says it's very important. Pollyanna nodded happily. Yes, it is. I know. I'll go. The doctor eyed her with some surprise. I'm not sure I shall let you after all, he declared, his eyes twinkling. You seemed more upsetting than soothing yesterday, young lady. Pollyanna laughed. Oh, it wasn't me, truly. Not really, you know. Not so much as it was Aunt Polly. The doctor turned with a quick start. Your aunt, he ejaculated. Pollyanna gave a happy little bounce in her seat. Yes, and it's so exciting and lovely. Just like a story, you know. I, I'm going to tell you, she burst out with sudden decision. He said not to mention it, but he wouldn't mind your knowing, of course. He meant not to mention it to her. Her? Yes, Aunt Polly. And of course he would want to tell her himself instead of having me to do it. Lovers, so. Lovers? As the doctor said the word, the horse started violently as if the hand that held the reins had given them a sharp jerk. Yes, nodded Pollyanna happily. That's the story part, you see. I didn't know it till Nancy told me. She said Aunt Polly had a lover years ago, and they quarreled. She didn't know who it was at first, but we found out now. It's Mr. Pendleton, you know. The doctor relaxed suddenly. The hand holding the reins fell limply to his lap. Oh, no, I didn't know, he said quietly. Pollyanna hurried on. They were nearing the Harrington homestead. 
yes, and I'm so glad now. It's come out lovely. Mr. Pendleton asked me to come and live with him. But of course I wouldn't leave Aunt Polly like that, after she's been so good to me. Then he told me all about the woman's hand and heart that he used to want. And I found out that he wanted it now, and I was so glad. For of course if he wants to make up the quarrel, everything will be all right now. And Aunt Polly and I will both go to live there, or else he'll come to live with us. Of course, Aunt Polly doesn't know yet, and we haven't got everything settled, so I suppose that is why he wanted to see me this afternoon, sure. The doctor sat suddenly erect. There was an odd smile on his lips. Yes, I can well imagine that Mr. John Pendleton does want to see you, Pollyanna. He nodded as he pulled his horse to a stop before the door. There's Aunt Polly now in the window, cried Pollyanna. Then a second later, I know she isn't, but I thought I saw her. No, she isn't there now, said the doctor. His lips had suddenly lost their smile. Pollyanna found a very nervous John Pendleton waiting for her that afternoon. Pollyanna, he began at once. I've been trying all night to puzzle out what you meant by all that yesterday, about my wanting your Aunt Polly's hand and heart here all those years. What did you mean? Why, because you were lovers, you know, once, and I was so glad you still felt that way now. Lovers? Your Aunt Polly and I? At the obvious surprise in the man's voice, Pollyanna opened wide her eyes. Why, Mr. Pendleton, Nancy said you were. The man gave a short little laugh. Indeed. Well, I am afraid I shall have to say that Nancy didn't know. Then you weren't lovers? Pollyanna's voice was tragic with dismay. Never? And it isn't all coming out like a book? There was no answer. The man's eyes were moodily fixed out the window. Oh, dear. And it was all going so splendidly, almost sobbed Pollyanna. I'd have been so glad to come with Aunt Polly. And you won't now? The man asked the question without turning his head. Of course not. I meant Polly's. The man turned now, almost fiercely. Before you were hers, Pollyanna, you were your mother's. And it was your mother's hand and heart that I wanted long years ago. My mother's? Yes. I had not meant to tell you, but perhaps it's better after all that I do, now. John Pendleton's face had grown very white. He was speaking with evident difficulty. Pollyanna, her eyes wide and frightened and her lips parted, was gazing at him fixedly. I loved your mother, but she didn't love me. And after a time, she went away with your father. I did not know until then how much I did care. The whole world suddenly seemed to turn black under my fingers and... But never mind. For long years, I have been a cross, crabbed, unlovable, unloved old man. Though I'm not nearly sixty yet, Pollyanna. Then, one day, like one of the prisms that you love so well, little girl, you danced into my life and flecked my dreary old world with dashes of the purple and gold and scarlet of your own bright cheeriness. I found out after a time who you were and, 
and I thought that I never wanted to see you again. I didn't want to be reminded of your mother. But you know how that came out. I just had to have you come. And now I want you always. Pollyanna, won't you come now? But Mr. Pendleton, I... There's Aunt Polly. Pollyanna's eyes were blurred with tears. The man made an impatient gesture. What about me? How do you suppose I'm going to be glad about anything without you? Why, Pollyanna, it's only since you came that I've been even half glad to live. But if I had you for my own little girl, I'd be glad for anything. And I'd try to make you glad too, my dear. You shouldn't have a wish ungratified. All my money to the last cent should go to make you happy. Pollyanna looked shocked. Why, Mr. Pendleton, as if I'd let you spend it on me. All that money you saved for the heathen. A dull red came to the man's face. He started to speak, but Pollyanna was still talking. Besides, anybody with such a lot of money as you have doesn't need me to make you glad about things. You're making other folks so glad giving them things that you just can't help being glad yourself. Why, look at those prisms you gave Mrs. Snow and me. And the gold piece you gave Nancy on her birthday and... Yes, yes, never mind about all that, interrupted the man. His face was very, very red now, and no wonder, perhaps. It was not for giving things that John Pendleton had been best known in the past. That's all nonsense. It wasn't much anyhow. But what there was, was because of you. You gave those things, not I. Yes, you did, he repeated, in answer to the shocked denial in her face. And that only goes to prove all the more how I need you, little girl, he added, his voice softening into tender pleading once more. If ever, ever I am to play the glad game, Pollyanna, you will have to come and play it with me. The little girl's forehead puckered into a wistful frown. Aunt Polly has been so good to me, she began, but the man interrupted her sharply. The old irritability had come back to his face. Impatience, which would brook no opposition, had been a part of John Pendleton's nature too long to yield very easily now to restraint. Of course she's been good to you. But she doesn't want you, I'll warrant, half so much as I do, he contested. Why, Mr. Pendleton, she's glad I know to have... Glad, interrupted the man, thoroughly losing his patience now. I'll wager Miss Polly doesn't know how to be glad for anything. Oh, she does her duty, I know. She's a very dutiful woman. I've had experience with her duty before. I'll acknowledge we haven't been the best of friends for the last 15 or 20 years, but I know her. Everyone knows her. And she isn't the glad kind, Pollyanna. She doesn't know how to be. As for your coming to me, you just ask her and see if she won't let you come. And oh, little girl, little girl, I want you so. He finished brokenly. Pollyanna rose to her feet with a long sigh. All right, I'll ask her, she said wistfully. Of course, I don't mean that I wouldn't like to live here with you, Mr. Pendleton, but... She did not complete her sentence. There was a moment's silence. Then she added, Well, anyhow... I'm glad I didn't tell her yesterday. 
"'cause then I supposed she was wanted, too.' John Pendleton smiled grimly. "'Well, yes, Pollyanna. "'I guess it is just as well you didn't mention it yesterday.' "'I didn't. "'Only to the doctor. "'And, of course, he doesn't count.' "'The doctor!' cried John Pendleton, turning quickly. Doc Dr. Chilton? Yes, when he came to tell me you wanted to see me today, you know. Well, of all the... muttered the man, falling back in his chair. Then he sat up with sudden interest. And what did Dr. Chilton say? he asked. Pollyanna frowned thoughtfully. Why, I don't remember. Not much, I reckon. Oh, he did say he could well imagine you did want to see me. Oh, did he indeed? Answered John Pendleton. And Pollyanna wondered why he gave that sudden, queer little laugh. End of Chapter 20 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 21 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 21 A Question Answered. The sky was darkening fast with what appeared to be an approaching thunder shower when Pollyanna hurried down the hill from John Pendleton's house. Halfway home, she met Nancy with an umbrella. By that time, however, the clouds had shifted their position, and the shower was not so imminent. "'Guess it's going round to the north,' announced Nancy, eyeing the sky critically. "'I thought twas all the time, but Miss Polly wanted me to come with this. She was worried about ye.' "'Was she?' murmured Pollyanna abstractedly, eyeing the clouds in her turn. Nancy sniffed a little. "'You don't seem to notice what I said,' she observed aggrievedly. "'I said your aunt was worried about ye.' "'Oh,' sighed Pollyanna, remembering suddenly the question she was so soon to ask her aunt. "'I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare her.' "'Well, I'm glad.' retorted Nancy unexpectedly. I am, I am. Pollyanna stared. Glad that Aunt Polly was scared about me? Why, Nancy, that isn't the way to play the game, to be glad for things like that, she objected. There want no game in it, retorted Nancy. Never thought of it. You don't seem to sense what it means to have Miss Polly worried about ye, child. Why, it means worried, and worried is horrid to feel, maintained Pollyanna. What else can it mean? Nancy tossed her head. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means she's at last getting down somewheres near human, like folks and that she ain't just doing her duty by ye all the time. Why, Nancy, demurred the scandalized Pollyanna. Aunt Polly always does her duty. She, she's a very dutiful woman. Unconsciously, Pollyanna repeated John Pendleton's words of half an hour before. Nancy chuckled. You're right, she is, and she always was, I guess. But she's something more now since you came. Pollyanna's face changed. Her brows drew into a troubled frown. There, that's what I was going to ask you, Nancy, she sighed. Do you think Aunt Polly likes to have me here? Would she mind if I wasn't here any more? Nancy threw a quick look into the little girl's absorbed face. 
She had expected to be asked this question long before, and she had dreaded it. She had wondered how she should answer it, how she could answer it honestly without cruelly hurting the questioner. But now, now, in the face of the new suspicions that had become convictions by the afternoon's umbrella sending, Nancy only welcomed the question with open arms. She was sure that, with a clean conscience today, she could set the love-hungry little girl's heart at rest. "'Likes to have you here. Would she miss ye if you want here?' cried Nancy indignantly. "'As if that weren't just what I was telling of ye. Didn't she send me post-haste with an umbrella, cause she could see a little cloud in the sky?' Didn't she make me tote your things all downstairs so you could have the pretty room you wanted? Why, Miss Pollyanna, when you remember how at first she hated to have... With a choking cough, Nancy pulled herself up just in time. And it ain't just things I can put my fingers on, neither, rushed on Nancy breathlessly. It's little ways she has that shows how you've been softening her up and mellowing her down. The cat and the dog and the way she speaks to me and, oh, lots of things. Why, Miss Pollyanna, there ain't no telling how she'd miss ye if you want here, finished Nancy, speaking with an enthusiastic certainty that was meant to hide the perilous admission she had almost made before. Even then she was not quite prepared for the sudden joy that illumined Pollyanna's face. Oh, Nancy, I'm so glad, glad, glad. You don't know how glad I am that Aunt Polly wants me. As if I'd leave her now, thought Pollyanna as she climbed the stairs to her room a little later. I always knew I wanted to live with Aunt Polly, but I reckon maybe I didn't know quite how much I wanted Aunt Polly to want to live with me. The task of telling John Pendleton of her decision would not be an easy one, Pollyanna knew, and she dreaded it. She was very fond of John Pendleton, and she was very sorry for him, because he seemed to be so sorry for himself. She was sorry, too, for the long, lonely life that had made him so unhappy, and she was grieved that it had been because of her mother that he had spent those dreary years. She pictured the great, gray house as it would be after its master was well again, with its silent rooms, its littered floors, its disordered desk, and her heart ached for his loneliness. She wished that somewhere, someone might be found who... And it was at this point that she sprang to her feet with a little cry of joy at the thought that had come to her. As soon as she could, after that, she hurried up the hill to John Pendleton's house, and in due time she found herself in the great, dim library, with John Pendleton himself sitting near her, his long, thin hands lying idle on the arms of his chair, and his faithful little dog at his feet. "'Well, Pollyanna, is it to be the glad game with me all the rest of my life?' asked the man gently. "'Oh, yes,' cried Pollyanna. "'I've thought of the very gladdest kind of a thing for you to do, and—' "'With you?' asked John Pendleton, his mouth growing a little stern at the corners. "'No, but—' "'Pollyanna, you aren't going to say no,' interrupted a voice deep with emotion. "'I— got to, Mr. Pendleton. Truly I have. Aunt Polly... Did she refuse to let you come? I... I didn't ask her, stammered the little girl miserably. Pollyanna. Pollyanna turned away her eyes. She could not meet the hurt, grieved gaze of her friend. So you didn't even ask her? couldn't, sir, truly, 
faltered Pollyanna. You see, I found out without asking. Aunt Polly wants me with her, and, and I want to stay too, she confessed bravely. You don't know how good she's been to me, and, and I think, really, sometimes she's beginning to be glad about things. Lots of things. And you know she never used to be. You said it yourself. Oh, Mr. Pendleton, I couldn't leave Aunt Polly now. There was a long pause. Only the snapping of the wood fire in the grate broke the silence. At last, however, the man spoke. No, Pollyanna, I see. You couldn't leave her. Now, he said, I won't ask you again. The last word was so low, it was almost inaudible. But Pollyanna heard. Oh, but you don't know about the rest of it, she reminded him eagerly. There's the very gladdest thing you can do. Truly there is. Not for me, Pollyanna. Yes, sir, for you. You said it. You said only a, a woman's hand and heart or a child's presence could make a home. And I can get it for you. A child's presence. Not me, you know, but another one. As if I would have any but you resented an indignant voice. But you will, when you know. You're so kind and good. Why, think of the prisms and the gold pieces and all that money you save for the heathen and... Pollyanna, interrupted the man savagely. Once for all, let us end that nonsense. I've tried to tell you half a dozen times before. There is no money for the heathen. I never sent a penny to them in my life. There. He lifted his chin and braced himself to meet what he expected. The grieved disappointment of Pollyanna's eyes. To his amazement, however, there was neither grief nor disappointment in Pollyanna's eyes. There was only surprised joy. Oh, oh, she cried, clapping her hands. I'm so glad. That is, she corrected, coloring distressfully. I don't mean that I'm not sorry for the heathen. Only just now, I can't help being glad that you don't want the little India boys, because all the rest have wanted them. And I'm so glad you'd rather have Jimmy Bean. Now I know you'll take him. Take who? Jimmy Bean. He's the child's presence, you know. And he'll be so glad to be it. I had to tell him last week that even my lady's aide out west wouldn't take him, and he was so disappointed. But now, when he hears of this, he'll be so glad. Will he? Well, I won't, ejaculated the man decisively. Pollyanna, this is sheer nonsense. You don't mean you won't take him? I certainly do mean just that. But he'd be a lovely child's presence, faltered Pollyanna. She was almost crying now. And you couldn't be lonesome with Jimmy round. I don't doubt it, rejoined the man. But I think I prefer the lonesomeness. It was then that Pollyanna, for the first time in weeks, suddenly remembered something Nancy had once told her. She raised her chin aggrievedly. Maybe you think a nice, live little boy wouldn't be better than that old dead skeleton you keep somewhere, but I think it would. <laughs> skeleton? Yes. Nancy said you had one in your closet, somewhere. Why, what? Suddenly, the man threw back his head and laughed. He laughed very heartily, indeed, so heartily that Pollyanna began to cry from pure nervousness. When he saw that, John Pendleton sat erect very promptly. His face grew grave at once. Pollyanna, 
I suspect you are right. More right than you know, he said gently. In fact, I know that a nice, live little boy would be far better than my skeleton in the closet. Only we aren't always willing to make the exchange. We are apt to still cling to our skeletons, Pollyanna. However, suppose you tell me a little more about this nice little boy. And Pollyanna told him. Perhaps the laugh cleared the air, or perhaps the pathos of Jimmy Bean's story, as told by Pollyanna's eager little lips, touched a heart already strangely softened. At all events, when Pollyanna went home that night, she carried with her an invitation for Jimmy Bean himself to call at the great house with Pollyanna the next Saturday afternoon. And I'm so glad, and I'm sure you'll like him, sighed Pollyanna as she said goodbye. I do so want Jimmy Bean to have a home, and folks that care, you know. End of chapter 21